Hello and welcome to episode 21. Um, I've had a few comments about the MS mic technique that we used, uh, asking how it works and whether or not it's possible to mix the type of microphones you use for the mid and side channels. So I did some research. Now, bearing in mind that my maths is A-level standard and goes back an awful long way, uh, it's always done me pretty well up till today. And looking at some very learned papers on the net, uh, my maths is nowhere near up to explaining some of the things that I've actually discovered. Now, my, my firm belief is that if you can't do it with the maths, then you may as well do it as an experiment and see what happens. Now, the problem is this. We're quite comfy from the previous videos with the different styles of microphones in terms of how they work. So we're all now pretty well okay with cardioids, omnis, figure of eights. We've done shotgun microphones. So we've pretty comprehensively covered that. But what we haven't considered very well is how the microphones actually do it. Now, in reality, there are two different types of microphones. Those that work on pressure, uh, and the most common one, of course, is an omnidirectional microphone. You have a back plate, you have a membrane in front of it, the sound comes through the hole in the microphone, hits the diaphragm, and that hit generates the voltage that comes out of the output after some preamps and fiddling about. But essentially, it's the movement of that membrane on the front that creates the output of the microphone. Now, pressure is a bit weird, uh, and it actually is a process that is in all dimensions. So pressure either goes up or it goes down. It doesn't have a direction. It's equal in every direction. So if a microphone is worked by pressure, it doesn't matter where the sound comes from. The fact that the sound arrives at the mic is enough to produce an output. And the actual origin distance, uh, angle, is totally irrelevant. Now, you have to be careful because when we make comments about microphones, we sort of, we make absolute statements. And this is not strictly speaking true. Because if you think about it, um, if you actually sealed up that airspace in front, in front of the back plate of a microphone and the moving diaphragm at the front, if you sealed that completely, then one, when the actual membrane tries to bend, the pressure inside will increase. Uh, equally, when the pressure outside reduces, the membrane bends the other way and the pressure inside resists that. On top of that, the pressure in the world, depending on where you are, varies. So if you took your microphone to the top of Mont Blanc, um, the actual pressure there is much, much lower. Worse still, try and do some recording on an aeroplane. Pressure is even lower. I mean, aeroplanes have to pressurise when they get to a certain altitude. So if that membrane and back plate were totally sealed, it wouldn't work very well because the pressure difference between the outside and the inside would bend and straighten that diaphragm. So they actually make a tiny little relief hole. It's minuscule, but it does mean that the outside air can get in and equalise that pressure. So we can't make an absolute statement and say they're sealed, because they're not. There's a small microscopic size hole that makes no difference at all to the actual operation of the audio side of the microphone. So we can ignore it and essentially we tell people they're sealed. The pressure operation um, is countered by another type of microphone and frequently this one is referred to as the figure of eight one, where Sound can get to the moving part, the, the element that produces the voltage, from a number of directions. I mean, it's very obvious in a figure of eight microphone, I mean, typically a ribbon, but it's very obvious that the ribbon has a direct path through it from the front to the back. They're both, they're both open. So they don't work on pressure. They work on a difference in pressure because when you talk into a ribbon, uh, the majority of the audio input is coming from one direction, but some of it will go around the back and leak backwards. So there is a difference between the front and the back. If you look at a cardioid, uh, the dynamic mic that's very commonly known as a pressure gradient mic, 
if you look at the inside of a Shure SM58, which is a dynamic microphone, a pressure gradient microphone, you can see that there is an opening in that direction, but there are also openings all the way around the outside. So the sound, some of it lands that way, that's what we want, some of it will go in through that. Now that creates a difference in pressure and these microphones work on that principle. There's also a type of microphone that's described as a velocity microphone, as in a microphone that responds to the speed in which the sound pressure wave hits it and goes through. Most microphones that actually are described as working on velocity are really pressure gradient microphones. So it's a sort of microphone that is theoretically possible and nobody seems to make one that works on that principle that I can find. Uh, I'm very happy to be proved wrong on that, but I can't find anybody that describes their microphone as operating as a velocity microphone. Some of them do mention it responds to velocity, but that's also a phenomenon of a pressure gradient microphone. That's confused everybody, hasn't it? It's completely over my head in certain places. And once you start looking at the learned papers, which is a good way of assessing the quality of printed matter mainly, where there are facts and figures and graphs and charts. The reality is most day-to-day -day microphones that we come in contact with revolve around either pressure or differences in pressure. And as a concept, that, that works pretty well and I think it's accurate enough to use as a pretty level statement. Now, the differences are also affected by time. This is where it gets a bit more complicated, so that a ribbon microphone, according to the absolute measurements and science, does have this velocity element. And if it has that, it also means that there is a time difference. Now, we relate time in audio generally as phase. So we have a phase difference between types of microphones. I wanted to use a condenser as a mid microphone and use a ribbon microphone as a side microphone. Seemed perfectly sensible to me. I'd got both available and I was planning to use that on a recent job. It was pointed out to me that because ribbons operate in a slightly different way, there's actually a phase lag. And I've actually been told Two different figures for that. The information suggests that there is a 45 to 90 degree difference in the phase shift compared to a typical condenser. Um, this is a problem because the science for this is the heavyweight stuff. And I couldn't find anything that I understood that let me say categorically that if you use a ribbon microphone you will get a 45 degree lag in the phase shift or whether you'll get a 90 degree lag. Uh, one particular document I read that looked back at the way that RCA made their ribbon microphones back in the pre-war times suggested that there were two phenomena and together they could actually produce 180 degrees of phase shift. Uh, I never read that anywhere else, but that was on one particular quite impressive document. Now, what's the reality to us? Um, you know, does it matter? Uh, I decided the only sensible way to do this would be a test. So what I've done is inflicted my guitar playing on you again. And I've set up a one-piece stereo microphone. I've had this microphone for a long time now and I had it made for me by one of the Chinese factories. At that time I was buying some, I wanted some Omni and cardioid switchable microphones for a project and I couldn't find one, certainly not in the price range that I'd got available. So I asked the factory in China if they could make me these Omni and cardioid switchable mics and they said yeah no problem. And they did, and they were quite nice, and they did the job, and at the end of the job, I sold all them bar. I think, I, I think I've still got two, maybe three, somewhere. Um, but they sounded really nice. And then I remembered the microphone that I saw published in a magazine, probably 
mid 70s or so. It was a Neumann SM69 and the SM69 was a multi-pattern microphone but it had two in one unit and you swiveled the top section to create the difference. So we've done lots of things with microphones and we've been crossing them at various angles and we've been doing figure eights and we've been doing blumlins and we've been doing all sorts of things with them. Um, but essentially the SM69 had got figure of eight, omni and cardioid in both elements and then you moved one in the single housing. So you could do so many different techniques with just one microphone. Um, so I asked the factory, could you make me one? And they did. They made that. Um, it's a nice looking microphone. This section here uh, can be switched between cardioid figure eight and omni. Uh, there is a minus 10 dB pad available. I'll switch on the other side. And then underneath it is another identical unit and it spins through 90 degrees. So if I set them both to cardioid, spin them through 90 degrees, I've got an XY. Now, near coincident pairs, well, it's as close as it could possibly be. The two capsules are, are almost touching each other. So we've got XY in there. Uh, if we switch one to figure of eight, turn it through 90 degrees, put the other one on cardioid, we've actually got an MS pair. The MS pair could also be with an Omni mic if necessary, so we'd actually have some pickup in both directions. So the, the mid would be mid front and mid rear and then sides. And then of course we could switch them to any combination of those patterns we want. And I've had that one. Um, it's a little bit fragile. I'm very reluctant to do too much with it really. Uh, I have repaired it a couple of times where inside the um, metalwork is brazed together. I mean obviously someone sat there on the bench in the factory and they've just brazed up this impressive looking thing, joined it together and sold it to me. Um, I'm very, very happy with its performance, but it tends to not go out that much just because it is quite fragile. So I look after it um, quite well. I used it on a recent recording and um, I put it into Blumlin Stereo because I'd had some success recently at that venue with Blumlin. And although I noticed that the sound low down was not as reverberant as I thought it should be, I figured that it, because it had this huge vaulted roof, it really should be better. So I decided to mount it extremely high and um, I managed to string a cable across from the left to the right side and I hung it off that, but it was very, very high. And um, it was frankly too high and the results were a bit too reverberant and I couldn't really use it in the main recording. And I used it on uh, one particular song that was, was sung that was going to be used for a different um, purpose. And so I used it on that track and it's pretty well sort of big sounding. Uh, so that was that was a nice thing. Uh, it worked. It worked for that one particular song. Uh, on the others, it was far too mushy. Uh, there was no real diction. Uh, it was just a bit too huge. So uh, it, it was an experiment that worked for one song and failed miserably on the others. But I guess that's what audio recording is about. So here we've got this microphone set up. Immediately below it, I've put a ribbon. So I've now got the option of using the mid from one of those condensers and also the side from a condenser and a side from the ribbon. Now I figured that what I could do is record all that lot and then let you have a listen. Um, I think one of the other things we could possibly do is try a phase test. So you'll be able to hear that um, guitar recorded with the two different types of side mic. So testing out the theory whether we're going to get phase shifts that mess things up or whether it will sound better or worse, I, I really don't know. So I've recorded the microphone in MS and we're going to be able to try the different 
microphones to see if that phase shift, if it happens, uh, enhances or destroys the recording. I mean, it could be a happy accident and it makes it sound better. I really don't know. Uh, so it's another one of these things that we're going to have to give a, a suck it and see approach to. But what I thought we would also need to do is have a look at it on a screen. So we can use a stereoscope, we can look at that type of uh, evidence as to how they perform. But it might be good if I record a tone. If I record a tone, then we can put them on the screen and see if one is actually ahead or not. That's the theory behind the experiment. Uh, as to whether it's going to work, I, I really don't know. <laughs> Conclusive, not conclusive, you have to make your own mind up here, but we've got clearly some differences between the microphones. You're going to have to decide whether these differences are to do with phase shift, tonality, or any of the other things. But at least now we've got something we can compare it to. The thing with this is it's got to be subjective. I mean, we've played some random tones with 500 hertz and 1K. We've listened to the two different microphones recording a guitar. Um, and we've had a bit of a chat about the, the physics. The physics has beaten me, but the basics are quite obvious. We've got a possibility of phase shift. Whether that phase shift improves or detracts from the recording, I don't know. But we've got some results and uh, you'll have to sort of have a look yourself and decide whether you think they're worth considering or not. Uh, the choice is, as usual, entirely yours. You've got some basic things to test your brain on. Uh, if your brain can make sense of them, great. If your brain can't, use your ears and pick the one that works for you. Well, I've been looking back at the clips and listening to the audio and looking at them on the screen in the editor. And the condenser and ribbon side mics are indeed 45 degrees out of phase. What I did was record a tone. I used a, a 500 hertz tone and a, a 1K tone. But the 500 hertz tone was easier to see. And when you look at the two things at the same time on the screen, the ribbon microphone does indeed lag behind. So we've actually proved that the 45 degree phase shift actually takes place, is there and happens. I'm not sure I can really detect it in the audio, but there is a phase shift. So for once, I'm quite happy to say we've proven that one. So if anybody says to you, shall we use a ribbon as the side mic and a condenser as the mid mic in an MS configuration, you at least can now say, well, maybe you should think that through a bit more. Um, or just like I will do, Use the one that sounds nicest and worry about it afterwards. 
There is, of course, a little bit of uh, consideration that needs paying to the concept of phase anyway. Because if you move a microphone further away from the sound source, the sound takes longer to get there. So phase will drift with microphone spacing. So that's another one. Maybe we should do that in a separate video. This one's probably like driven you to insanity by now. So you've now seen all these things, fried your brain, used your ears. Um, if it was useful, great. Hit the subscribe button. Tell me if you like the video. Tell me if you hate the video. I really don't mind. And uh, I'll take all the comments on board. We need to do these quite heavy ones sometimes, and I'm never quite sure how far to take it. So I do appreciate the comments that people keep emailing me. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching and see you on the next one. Take care. Have a good week. Bye.